What's up? What's up, everybody? I haven't done a TikTok live in a long time. I am working on some class stuff. Anyway, what's up, everybody? My name is Iglali. I'm the person behind Mexican Excellence. I am a historian, poet, and activist. I am a community college professor. I teach ethnic studies and history. And I'm also a self-published poet. I, my book, Don't Call Me Latina, No Term of Decolonizing Mexicana, Reclaiming Everything That Is Ours, just came out last year. So, acaba de cumplir un año. Beatriz, oh my goodness, what's up, sis? Arizona in the house. What's up, sis? ¿Cómo estás? Yes, so I wanted to take, I haven't done a TikTok live in a long time, but I wanted to come out here and just check in real quick. Let you know who the heck this is behind this page, Mexican Excellence. My name is Citlali. I am a historian, poet, activist for the last 26 years. I currently teach ethnic studies and history at various community colleges. And I also uh, teach private classes called e Decolonize, where I talk about anti-colonial educational approaches to understanding Mexican history, women of Mesoamerica, and history of the Americas. I am currently working on some grading here um, but I'm really excited I wanted to be here I actually started on YouTube so for those old school heads out here uh, make sure that you go to YouTube and that you follow me because that's where I'm old school yo I like to explain things talk about things invite people interview people give you book reviews I do all that on YouTube I've been on YouTube since 2008 and I started on TikTok in 2021, I want to say, um, because of my sisters, they're like, sis, you need to get on TikTok. And I was like, all right. Um, so anyway, here I am and I create content that I hope helps you understand some of the complexities of colonial history. I specifically focus, I, from my background, I consider myself a de-indigenized Mexican woman, which means that I am the fourth generation removed from a Nahuatl speaking community of Jalisco. My roots come from Jalisco and Baja California. So shout out to Rosarito, Mexicali, Tijuana, uh, all that, right, is part of my heritage. And I work really, really, really diligently to make history accessible because as a historian, it is my approach, it is my understanding of history that we see history as an oppressive system because it has been used to oppress us and invisibilize us and silence us, right? And form it, these narratives of white supremacy. But when you are doing anti-colonial work and you see history as a system of liberation, then that's where I come in, right? I see history as medicine. I see history as healing, right? Because if you study and you put together the puzzle that has been shattered by white supremacy, it makes it very powerful and very transformative where you see your people centered in the narrative and you understand how the systems of white supremacy and oppression have very limited, um, have, have limited our understanding of who we are and our power, which is a reflection of a lot of the issues that we face as a community, right? So that's, what I'm talking about. That's what I've experienced. That's what I'm coming to the table about. My journey started in, in 1997. That's when I started my journey. I was 15 years old. Um, that's, the, yeah, that's when I started my, my journey. And I started understanding my history, right? Because we're not taught our history. Uh, so Serene, oh my God, your words are clarity. Thank you so much. Thank you. And ever since, you know, I just have this passion to to share knowledge, to let people know what's going on. Because when I started learning at age 15 that we were the survivors of the biggest Holocaust, that this was part of our land, that ancestrally we've been united for millennia, right? That the terms Hispanic or Latino are colonial markers, right, to reinforce white supremacy, all these things, I was like, what the fuck? Like, what is up, right? What's happening? And so ever since then, I've just had this passion and this commitment to making sure that our ancestors that our ancestors are heard and understood and that we stop watering ourselves down for anything, right? We need to stop watering ourselves down for any system, for any institution. 
and which is why I had a love-hate relationship with academia, right? But thankfully, um, towards the end, I would say more closer to where my age now, I got with it. I was like, you know what? I am going to get my degrees. I In 2008, that's when I was inspired to become an um, uh, ethnic studies and history professor. And ever since, I've I worked hard, right? I worked hard to get my degrees. I show to show up authentically and to reclaim spaces that belong to us, right? So I'm very thankful that as of this year, I started teaching at community colleges, right? I obtained my degrees 2016, 2019, uh, 2020. I became pregnant with my beautiful, beautiful son. And I've been really been able to enjoy him and enjoy motherhood. And as I seek my my careers, as I seek what I do, right, I also, 2020 was a powerful year, right? It's also when I got inspired to write this book, Don't Call Me Latina, which you can find on Amazon, by the way, because I was like, yo, it's been 24 years and people are still using this term. Like, what is going on? Like, I would think that by now we would understand that this is all white supremacy based, Right. And so I was like, you know what? I need to write another book. This is my third book, by the way. I was like, I need to write a book where I get everything down. I get all, like every reason, every research point, every historical argument that I can do, I'm going to put it in this book, right? So that I can do the best that I can to invite people to dismantle Latinidad and dismantle this idea that we are homogenized in one ethnic group and one identity, it's completely fraudulent, right? It's completely fraudulent and we have to talk about it, right? We have to talk about it. Nilce, Nilce, thank you. Congratulations, your story is inspiring and I can really relate. Thank you. I'm ordering your book, ACP. Thank you so much. Cicerain. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. My apologies. But yes, you also like, there's so much. There's so much. So anyway, in this book, I was like, by the way, that's me. I think I'm like six years old or five years old. I forgot. But that's me. This is in Cudahy, California. This house doesn't exist anymore, by the way. Um, and that's me wearing my Cinco de Mayo skirt. And it was not Cinco de Mayo. I just liked it. And I'm wearing this thrifty shirt because thrifty, thrift clothes, that's what I wore unapologetically. Y bien trasquilada because I used to cut my own hair and I still do, by the way. So anyway, that's the cover. It says, don't call me Latina. No termo decolonizing Mexicana reclaiming everything that is ours. Really short, right? Short, <laughs> short title. Anyway, so in this book, I basically put it all down, like, all the poetry that talks about this, the photography, the informational memes that I talked about, um, books that I recommend, things that I have to say. I consider myself a ruka, right? I've been in this movement for about 27 years this year, and I have a lot of things to say. I've been involved. I have experience. There's a lot of reflections that I can offer my community. And among those reflections in chapter three, oh, let me, let me give you a little rundown about what's in this book. So, first and foremost, I, I dedicate the book to my grandmother, uh, my grandmother Mer Mercedes. I love, 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 love my grandmother. She's like a mother to me. Like, she's the reason why I keep going so much. Um, so, I dedicate this book to her. Right? I used to call her, call her La Reina de Rosarito. But anyway, so, first and foremost, starting the book with her energy, starting the book with her love, starting the book with her legacy, right? And this book is, uh, is it three chapters? Ya se me olvidó. I'll tell you right now. So in this book, I give you photography. I give you poetry. I give you historical notes. I give you reflections about why I don't want to be called Latina. And I'm tired of being called Latina. And the link for your, oh yeah, is the link for your book in your bio? I don't, I think so. Yes, it's in my link tree. So my link tree is here in my bio. Okay, um, nice. If not our daughters, our grandchildren. Thank you, Nakawe. So chapter one is called Corazón because it's poetry. Chapter two is called Cuerpo because it's photography. Chapter three is called Mente because it's reflections, right? And so it's very autobiographical because I'm like, I want to tell my story and I want to take up space and I want everyone to know about my family because we have so much in common. 
All right, so chapter one is poetry. So I take you back, right? I take you back. Let me give you the titles of the poems I have. Uh, titles of the poems. What am I? That poem I wrote in 1997. That's the first poem I ever wrote about learning my history when I started learning my history. August 1997, okay? That's how I start the book, to honor my 15-year-old self. Then the next poem is called Cudahy Girl because I was raised in Cudahy, California for a few years. That's part of Southeast Los Angeles, a small little town by Bell, Bell Gardens in Southgate. The next poem is called Peroxide. The next poem is called Mejorar la Raza, Empieza en la Casa. That's the first poem. Mejorar la Raza, Empieza en la Casa. Then I have Container. Then I have Rest in the Universe, Gabriel Fernandez. I talked about the tragedy of Gabriel Fernandez. Then my next poem is called Legality. And then this is part of my street poetry. This is what I do when I do street poetry. I walk around with protest signs all over primarily black and brown areas to talk about it and to take up space and to welcome conversation. We are not illegal in front of the Omec Head in Plaza Mexico, Linwood, California. Um, let's see what else. So that poem is called Legality. My next poem is called One for All, and it's about rejecting Latinidad and Hispanidad and all that. And, oh, check it out. I got to rap a little bit for you. So this is a rap song that you can find on YouTube, right? But this is my favorite verse. Is this my favorite verse? Let me read it first. Oh, it says, Spain is not our motherland. It's another lie created to keep us in, a, in, keep us in self hate. We must liberate our minds and begin to understand. We must resist the colonial traps they create. They continue to benefit, and we don't have a clue. Don't let Univision and Tevasteca fool you. Europeans speaking Spanish don't speak for you and me. Simply speaking Spanish doesn't make us the ethnicity. Grouping us together is just a marketing scheme, a way to buy us, a way to make us buy their products and making us believe that we are identical, that we all have the same needs, maximizing profit. It's targeting only one audience. What a great marketing monopoly. They save money and we lose our identity. That's just part of my little rap song. That's a poem. Um, and I actually have two versions of that in YouTube. So look up Rap Song by Mexican Excellence. Um, oh yeah, and then let me, I gotta read this one too. So this is the way I end my rap song. It says, Spanish-speaking Europeans still dominate our governments, our education systems, and our resources. There has never been true independence, just European civil wars on our continent. Whether they speak Spanish or English, European settlers are still in power. We are not Hispanic or Latino. Those terms do not define our people. Speaking the language doesn't make us the ethnicity. Grouping us together, it's a marketing scheme. They want to kill us with white supremacy. My next poem is called My Rage. I mean, what else? I'm going through the poem just to get an idea, right? Um, what I write about, what I talk about, what decolonization means to me, my unapologetic self. Here's my firecracker, talking about 4th of July. Red, white, and who the fuck are you? Talking about 4th of July during the uprisings of 2020. Abuelas, their silence is my rage. That's another poem where I dedicate to my grandmother. I have a poem called Purposely. I have a poem called My Path. A poem called Bodies Are Texts. Uh, Disconnected. I have a poem called Disconnected. Una Divinanza. What else? What else? What else? So those are some of the poems that I wrote. Cages. And then chapter two. It's mainly photography. Right? So each poem has a, a picture. As you can let me show you. Each poem has a picture about what connects, right? Like that's also me. We are indigenous people, not illegals. This is our continent. Um, and chapter two is cuerpo. So that's me. I think I was like 11 years old here. What you know about Banda Machos? What you know about Arcángel R. Quince in the 90s, right? So anyway, um, I have that. It's photography. Who else? I have, this is me in high school. I was a vice president of this club, Know Your History. And then these are my grandparents, my maternal grandparents from Jalisco. So autobiographical, poetic, as best as I can. I have protest pictures. 
And then chapter three is called Mente, right? So that's where I share my reflections. That's where I share statements, right? So Mente, what are you going to get in Mente? In Mente, I talk about, it says, No Storm of Decolonizing Mexicana, Reclaiming Everything That Is Ours. It says, Don't Call Me Latina. So why I say Don't Call Me Latina? For the 26 year, why am I saying Don't Call Me Latina, Right? It says, an identity tells your story. It introduces you to the world and tells others where you come from and what group of people or community you belong to. But what happens when identities are created for profit? What happens when identities are manufactured and funded by major corporations who do not have the interest in celebrating and embracing the complex and diverse people they claim to serve? What happens when identities only focus on one culture and ethnicity at the expense and erasure of others? That's how I start the reflection on don't call me Latina. And it says, don't call me Latina. No, seriously, don't. Nothing against Southern Europeans, French, Portuguese, Italians, but seriously, I'm not one of them. I'm not living in the Roman Empire. I'm not speaking Latin. I refuse to further centralize yet another Eurocentric identity. Yes, this also includes a new variation of the word including Latinx, Latine. Any revision of the term itself is a step further into erasure and white supremacy. A Eurocentric term that was created to homogenize and exploit diverse and complex groups of people will never honor us or our ancestors all right so that's part of my statement in don't call me latina it's about one two it's three pages all right it's three pages and then i get to the next one and then i share i'm a content creator i'm an educator so i use social media to present education to present critical perspectives right and I also share my research with you, right? So what does a Latino come from? Where does Latino come from? Where is the etymology of Latino? Latino comes from Latium, right? An ancient city in Rome. Where do Hispanics come from? Hispanic comes from Hispanicus, right? In Europe. So how the heck did we end up with these terms? So I talk about Napoleon and them using the term Latino, to use against uh, on Mexican people. And then I talk about the census report, the census report of 2020. Um, yes, Italianos, yes. So Latinos are the Southern Europeans, right? Which are Italian, French, Portuguese. Yes. And so that's where Latino come from. It's not us, right? And what else do I get into? I get into the census, I get into the 2020 census, I get into the 2010 census, and what does identity mean, what does identity represent about our people, and I also get into anti-blackness, how Latinidad is completely connected to anti-blackness, you just need to turn on Univision or Telemundo and you will see the colorism and the anti-blackness and the anti-indigeneity, anything that's not white is basically inferior, criminal, rapist, drug user, all that stuff, right? Um, wouldn't we all be Hispanic because we all speak Spanish? Under that logic, everyone who speaks English is Britannic, right? Which is my problem with the term Hispanic. And Hispanic is people or persons from Spain, which we're not from Spain. Uh, well, at least I'm not. And using simplistic terms like, oh, we're Hispanic because we speak Spanish, is also erasing those of us who don't speak Spanish because they speak indigenous languages primarily. And also Spanish language shouldn't be the determining factor on identity when you talk about colonization, right? So why isn't the African American community, the Asian American community, the Southeast Asian American community, why aren't they called Britannic, right? If they want to use those markers to identify language use. So language use should not define cultural ethnic identities, right? Especially when the production and the imposition of those languages came at a very uh, genocidal and tragic way, right? Which we're talking about the Spanish colonization and imposition onto our people. So no, I, if that were the case, then I'm Britannic right now because I'm speaking English. Right, so we had to be very critical about how these identities were shaped. 
But check out, actually check out my, or oh, we can have a whole conversation on this. Check out my YouTube videos on mestizaje, on Latino, on Hispano. There's so much. There's so, I'm so glad you're asking these questions. Check out my YouTube video, my YouTube channel called Mexican Excellence. I get into all of that, right? And mestizaje, that's another tricky one. Mestizaje, if you apply it to at least a Mexican experience, mestizaje is a concept of white supremacy. It was created as a way to center Europeanness and European features and culture at the time that they're trying to dis disempower and dispossess indigenous people of Mexico. But yes, there's a whole history to that. So check out my YouTube channel called Mexican Excellence. Type in the questions you have and they're all there. I have a whole video on uh, Latino called Manufacturing Latinidad. I have a whole video on mestizaje. I have a few videos on mestizaje. And one of the things about me is that I give you the sources. I am a historian. I care about transparency. I want you to know um, where I'm getting my information from, right? So you, as someone that's learning this, can go and check it out yourself, right? All right, so we talk about that, and yes, I talk about anti-blackness in Spanish-speaking media, anti-indigeneity, there is so much, um, and also why, why Latinidad is a capitalistic agenda, but is presented as, oh, Latino power, Latino unity, but no, check it out. So in this book called Race and Classification, this is where the term Latino comes from, check it out. It has been an invention of Cuban-American advertising executives in South Florida and New York who in the 70s and 80s were eager to lump and homogenize small Latin American national group identities into a larger unitary market sector. If they could create a clearly identifiable Latino market, they stood to profit enormously. They could then persuade large food, beverage, and domestic product manufacturers that Latinos constituted a significant mass market that needed special advertising campaigns only these agents were able to address. Right? So that is in this book, and I have it all for you. Did I give the page number? It's race and classification. So Latinidad is actually a product of capitalization of Cuban-American, white Cuban-American executives who had received a lot of um, rights, right, from the U.S. federal government because they came here during the time of Fidel Castro, right? And because the U.S. hates communism and they saw them as natural allies, they gave and granted them citizenship and resources, so many things. So because there's such a small number of the so-called Latinos, they created Latinidad as a way that they can invisibilize themselves as white Cubans under this gaze of like, oh, unity. And they can exploit the population because they're the ones that had the money to fund and to get lobbying support from the federal government, right? And so they create this umbrella term as Latinidad. They are not even 4% of the so-called Latinos in the U.S., right? But they control, I would say, about 90%. Of Spanish speaking corporations and media outlets. And why is it that Mexicans who make up 70% of the so called Latinos in the US, why is it that we are so disenfranchised and not connected to funding and representation as these people do? So, anyway, check out my, my YouTube channel. I get a lot more details into that. But it's important to understand, right, that people present Latinidad. On, oh, this, well, we're all united, we're all one community. No, we're not. That was a forced concept of capitalism to create a false sense of unity that has been created and continues to exploit our communities by the Cuban American, which are mainly white people. Europeans who speak Spanish should not have the monopoly of a representation to get to tell us who we are and who we are not, right? So that's very important for us to understand. And yes, 70%, 70% of the so-called Latinos are Mexican, right? Only about 3% or less than 4% are Cuban, but those Cuban Americans are the ones that are in control of Spanish-speaking media. 
right? So that has a lot to do with their incentives and the resources that they were automatically given by the U.S. government when they came here under Fidel Castro, right? Uh, what are your thoughts on reconnection for those of us who are hundreds of years post? Um, well, this is, that's a really interesting question because I use re the term reconnecting a little bit. I use it a little bit, right? Um, and so I had a really powerful conversation with a relative of mine. And we're like, wait a second. There's so many different experiences, right? Um, of what it is to be indigenous. And by the way, there are some people in Mexico who don't like to be called indigenous, right? There are people in the Mapuche nation who don't like to be called indigenous, right? So that to me, the more I expand my understanding of history, I really start to, to think of how we use terms to identify. So it really depends. That's a really hard conversation because it depends on what you identify as being indigenous or not or being connected or not. And this is a conversation I had with my relative, right? We said how those of us who are who are not, like I'm the fourth generation removed from a Nahuatl speaking community in Jalisco. That's as far as I know. We spoke Nahuatl. I do not know which variant because Nahuatl has over 20 variants, right, of Nahuatl. So, and that I learned through speaknahuatl.com. So let's understand that, right? Nahuatl is not just one. It is 20 different variants of Nahuatl. So I, my personal family, I am the fourth generation removed, meaning that my great-great-grandfather on my mother's side was the last to speak Nahuatl. Now, I don't know which variant it is. Through my dad's side, I have very limited access, so I haven't been able to determine that. But the way that many of many people who had to leave those communities, right, were because of the pressures of a racist Mexican government that was completely violent, that was completely dispossessing indigenous people, that was completely pressuring indigenous people to Hispanicize themselves, right? There's policies in Mexico. There were boarding schools in Mexico. There are boarding schools in Mexico that said, don't speak indigenous language. That's backward. That's where get with the times, right? Post-revolutionary Mexico was really trying to reconstruct itself based on these ideas of modernity and nationalism, which had to do with mestizaje, which had to do with eugenics, which had to do with being a fifth race, right? Um, being a fifth race in Mexico, which is a concept that was popularized by Jose Vasconcelos, who was the secretary of education in 1925 in Mexico, he was a eugenist who was also a paid propagandist from the Nazi party and who didn't see indigenous Mexicans and black Mexicans as anything but backward, right, and savage. So he was saying in order for us to be modern and to be able to compete with the modern world, we need to have an identity that puts us forward, right, that places us forward, which meant European identity, Spanish language, right? So it was a very, very tricky way to try to say, oh, we're all mixed, we're all mixed. But let's focus on the Spanish language. Let's make sure that everyone um, practices a religion. Let's make sure that we validate and centralize European standards of beauty. So it was a lie, right? It was a lie. This whole idea that mestizaje, we're all mixed anyway, it's a lie, right? Because if you read his documents, if you read his book, Raza Cosmica, he talks about, actually, let me see if it's in my book. I think I mentioned it. He talks about how backward indigenous people are and black people are. Um, and so the ideas, those ideas impacted a lot of us, right? Not all indigenous people, not all Mexicans are indigenous people, right? Um, if we want to use that category. But we have to understand the impact of colonial racist policies in Mexico and how it affected many 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 of our ancestors the book oh let me see if there's another one the book that i'm talking about is called um raza cosmica by jose vasconcelos he's the one that coined the term uh, raza cosmica and the fifth race but he's just one he's one of the many mexican racists who were trying to tell indigenous people don't speak spanish so that gets me to my point so in Mexico, those of us that come from those communities, our ancestors, 
and, and you have to you know verify this in your community but at one point they had to leave their hometown because why because of the economic destruction that mexico was in right and under porfirio diaz he nationalized um he privatized a lot of lands and a lot of corporations so a lot of lands of indigenous peoples were taken by the federal government right and so Indigenous people in Mexico suffer from policies that take away their land rights, that take away their access, right? That also push them into this whiteness. Oh, habla, habla español. In Mexico, it, to speak Spanish is to be cultured, is to be civilized, right? So a lot of our ancestors left their hometowns because they had no economic opportunity, right? My great-grandfather came to Compton, California as a bracero in the 40s. Okay, so that's how my placement in this part of Tangva Kish territory begins. My history begins there, right? In the 40s, my great grandfather, who is a bracero, is contracted as a bracero, right, to be here in um, in Los Angeles. He started his home here in Compton, California. And so through all of these histories, we don't consider that an indigenous experience. But if we're talking about disconnect and reconnecting, it really depends on even the terminology. Like I used reconnecting a little bit, but I stopped using it because I was like, wait a second. It's not that we're connected, disconnected. It's how we acknowledge the continuation of our traditions and practices and how we don't. Right. And it's also to say that a lot of people romanticize the indigenous identity, right? A lot of people romanticize it and say, oh, yes, you know, we were this, we were that. Um, without understanding that there are communities, there are communities that are indigenous today, right? That don't fall into those romanticized ideas of what it is to be indigenous, right? So that's very, that's very, very important. And for us to understand that. Right. So that's why, to me, I don't use the term reconnecting. Um, I, for myself, I call myself de-indigenized because thanks to the work of Yasnaya Aguilar Gil, who is a Mije woman, and Guillermo Bonfil Batalla, and Federico Navarrete, and all these other people, they really helped me understand that those of us who have this history and this experience, right, really come from um a a violently displaced community right linguistically displaced we were not just you know displaced physically but we were displaced linguistically and what does that look like right um an example i have to share this with you in the last few minutes that i'm here in mexico they force people to identify as mestizo instead of indigenous because they wanted to make it seem that there were far more mestizos than indigenous people. So what did they do? They simply manipulated census records. They, I think it was 3.5 million people um, between 1821 and 1910. 3.5 million Mexican indigenous people were recategorized as mestizo, right? So you went from being indigenous, speaking your language, to all of a sudden the government is going to re-identify you as mestizo, right? Because they're imposing on you these literacy programs. And so Federico Navarrete, who is the historian that I really look into and I really study from, he says the whole idea of mestizaje was a linguistic displacement. It didn't happen culturally. It happened linguistically. Right? It happened linguistically. So language patterns matter. Right? What is the relationship between power and language? Why is it that when Mexico created itself as a nation in 1821, about 70% of Mexicans were speaking an indigenous language, but the, the Mexican constitution is written in Spanish? There's a disconnect, right? It's the elite. It's the Spanish-Mexican elite who are governing and who are in leadership positions to impose these cultural markers of power. And a cultural marker is the language that was used in the Mexican um, constitution, at least one of the first ones, right? At a time where the majority of Mexicans, about 70% or more in 1821, we're not talking about 1500s or 1600s, we're talking that in 1821, 70% of us were still speaking an indigenous language. 
This is important for us to know. I just learned this about three years ago, mind you. I've been doing this for 26 years. And the last three years is where I learned that over 70% of Mexicans were speaking an indigenous language when this Mexico became a country. So if you do the math and if you find, find you know, you follow your lineage, you can look into your family records, right? I wasn't asking about what language patterns we had because in the 90s when I started learning this, it was impossible to imagine that one day we would have access to records now. Like now you have digitized archives. You can watch, you can see Mexican records. You can find the birth you know, records, the marriage records of your great grandparents. It's fucking crazy, right? So anyway, so you will find a lot of us, not all Mexicans, but a lot of us, especially those of us who have been displaced, linguistically removed, will find that our ancestor that spoke an indigenous language is far closer to us than previously thought i thought we have been speaking spanish in all of mexico for 500 years i thought that the majority of mexicans through everything that happened in the first century following the spanish invasion had been speaking spanish for 500 years i did not know that it had been 200 years right 200 years like this is amazing right and in closing, since I got to go because I got to eat, um, I want to invite you to check that out. So check out my book, First and Foremost. I have all the resources here. Check out my website. My website is my name, Citlalia Nahuac. Check out my YouTube channel under Mexican Excellence. Check out my book. If you get my book, it's all there. I give you recommended books, right? Check it out. So recommended books. I give you some reading resources. I give you some reflections, some data, some historical information. So there's a lot. There is a lot on here. And I also teach ethnic studies. And one of the things that I do in ethnic studies is that when we get into the Mexican-American, Chicano, Chicanx experience, we look at census records in the U.S., right? So I have my students look at census records in Mexico, and then I have them look at census records here in the U.S., right? And how the white supremacy in Mexico and the white supremacy in the U.S. have so many commonalities, but they also have distinctions, right? So it's just so much, so much to share. So for now, I could tell you is check out my website, is check out my the work that I do on my YouTube I'm old school. I like to speak for long periods of time. On TikTok, it's like quick, right? Like there's some videos that you'll see on TikTok that I can say things pretty quick, but by no means is it the extension of the conversation, right? I am a historian. I like to present the information where I get my, my info from, right? So that way you can see how I'm putting together these arguments based on what type of evidence, right? So it's very, very important. So if so if five states belong to Mexico, then the colonists came and took it, the remaining Mexicans. So yes, so five states belong to Mexico, but we also have to understand that the na Mexican nation was built on this part, right? When we're getting to this part on indigenous Native American land, right? So there's like a layered colonization there. And so when this land was forcefully taken because 15 million dollars ain't shit when this became the u.s in 1848 a hundred thousand mexicans were stolen right they were said oh stay you have a year to decide if you want to become a u.s citizen or not a hundred thousand mexicans who were here in these five states right stood here in what is called the u.s right so what happened to those hundred thousand mexicans well, that's what we got to study history, right? That's what we have to study history because those 100,000 Mexicans, when they wanted to become citizens at this point in time in U.S. history, Native Americans were not considered citizens. So when Mexicans would try to get their citizenship, it was very often very confusing for white American settlers to be like, oh, but you're not white, but we, we did say we'll grant you citizenship, but you're more like a Native American so it's very interesting how the U.S. has tried to racialize us, right? Because to them, we were just other Indians. They're like, oh, they're just Indians. If you look at primary records, if you look at what the government was saying, if you look at how they were talking about Mexicans, we were just indigenous. That's it. They didn't think anything else, right? They didn't think we were white. No, they were like, oh, these are just indigenous people, right? 
And so when you follow the policies of, of the U.S. history and the census records, you will see that we were considered white, but not really white. It was like passable white, right? And then in 1930, they asked us to claim our race on the census in 1930, right? Um, and then in the 1940s, they have massive deportations. 1.8 million Mexicans are deported because we are blamed for the depression and we're blamed, we're the scapegoat, right? So then in the 30s, we have the mass, I'm sorry, in the 30s, we have massive deportation of Mexicans, right? Almost 2 million Mexicans, whether they were here born in what is the U.S. now or out, they didn't distinguish. They just deported us all. 1.8 million of us were deported. And then what happens is that after World War II, there is a lack of labor. And so now what they had to do is open contracts with the Mexican government because now they need our asses, right? Now they need our asses. So here we go in the Bracero contracts, right? The Bracero contracts is a contract labor agreement between Mexican government and U.S. government that it will allow certain amount of Mexican citizens to work in the U.S. for allocated time, right? And then that they had to return back to Mexico. So I'm telling you, right? The way that we are racialized, and this is very important to understand, right? Because it's white supremacy functions in different ways, right? And it expresses itself differently. And it impacts our people differently depending on who's in power and who's in control. And how are they going to use those markers to establish that power over our population, right? So anyways, I hope that that was educational for y'all. Don't forget to follow me on YouTube, and I'm also on Instagram under Mexican Excellence. Don't forget to support independent poets, independent writers like myself. Don't call me Latina. This is a year old. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. It was turned one. It turned one yesterday. It's a year old. Hi, baby. It's called Don't Call Me Latina, No Trauma Decolonizing Mexicana, Reclaiming Everything That Is Ours. Bam. Um, it's on Amazon, and if you want an ebook, email me. I sell the ebook myself. I can email it to you. Um, my link tree has all my contact information. If you want me to speak, I speak at engagements. I do workshops. I do poetry workshops. I do speaking engagements. I am a historian. I teach at community colleges, but I also have private colleges. If you like what you're learning here, sign up for one of my classes. You don't have to be part of the community college. I have private courses that I teach this. Right, I teach anti-colonial Mexican history. I teach anti-colonial history of the Americas, which is more panoramic, right? And I teach women of Mesoamerica. Yes, this book is on Amazon. Don't call me Latina. Notes from a decolonizing Mexicana reclaiming everything that is ours. You can find it on Amazon. Right? And if you go on my YouTube channel, you will find me. Um, I have poetry readings from there. I have a book talk that I gave with some of the people that read it. Um, so, yeah. So, check it out. Let me know what you think. And, yes, thank you so much for joining me in this unannounced live. Um, look at the rest of my content on here. Tell me your thoughts. I'm going to try to make more videos. <laughs> so, tell me if there's anything in particular that you're interested in me breaking down. Um, I would love to to explain what I can and help you, you know, learn a little bit more about this. But my focus is anti-colonial history, specifically of Mexico. And I'm the person behind this page, Mexican Excellence. And why Mexican Excellence? Because Mexican has been used as a dirty word, right? And has been racialized in this country as a dirty word associated with backwardness, unhygienic, and let's reclaim that shit right so that's why i say mexican excellence because in this page you're going to see how excellent we are you're going to see how excellent our history is how excellent it is to love yourself embrace yourself and reclaim your power all right reclaim your power take up space stop watering yourself down stop minimizing yourself get your shit done represent don't be ashamed of who you are wear the nopal en la frente with fucking pride let's get it have a beautiful rest of your day